Thank you so much, Adlene. So now we're opening it up for questions and discussion. Yeah, can you please use the microphone for the yeah, I wanted to hear more about uh, the, the Peruvian um, situation we were talking about outside, uh, the erasure of the murals, right, and the outrage right now with this right-wing government that is like erasing culture and uh, so I, um, what you showed is incredible activism, and I wanted to know if that's been able to affect the incredible uh, shutdown that is occurring in Peru right now. So I don't know if you, did you guys hear about these murals in Lima? Has anybody heard about that here? Raise your hands. The Peruvians only. Great, that's good. <laughs> Um, so to make a, I think it's a very interesting case study. I think a lot of people are actually writing about it. I've heard a lot of scholars, young scholars are starting to take interest on this because the situation is this, we just had a left-wing government, I'm just gonna call it left-wing for now, uh, that, instill, uh, that, that began a bunch of cultural policies that we did not have before. Increased the budget, uh, I don't know, eight times fold, uh, generated a, a policy for museums or policy for archaeological sites, generated a living culture program that has received all sorts of recognition, uh, secured laws that would protect this over time, did all sorts of stuff. It, it, it did not do other stuff, which is a problem, but it did a lot of things. And for the first time ever, we sort of had a sense that there was this thing called cultural policy in the city for the first time in Lima. So now we have a new mayor. It was the mayor that was there before, before for eight years, way before, he's back. And in some sort of weird turn of events, they weren't that weird. They're weird for naive people and in, you know, ingenuity is wonderful because you think, you know, we did something. It's impossible that they'll take that away and they did. They've just begun systematically to take that down. Now, what you were saying, I've just shown a couple of examples from Peru, a lot from Bolivia actually in the list. Um, I think what's happened right now is that this content and the, you know, people are really, you know, there's a lot of indignation. There's a lot of, you know, just people not thinking that this was possible, that you could just simply walk in there first, fire everybody that was in the main secretary of culture, just take them all out. Second of all, just one day decide, you know, those murals that are all over the city, we're gonna paint them yellow. That's my party's color. We're gonna erase them all. And when they come and, you know, tell me, like, what are you doing? I'll say, I'm gonna erase them all, you know, and, and mention that UNESCO might want me to do that, which is not true, and then UNESCO comes out, and it's just a mess, right? So you have a lot of people mobilized and meeting and holding meetings and opening up Facebook pages, and I was telling Arlene, we have uh, the word cultural policy on the front page of the largest newspaper in Peru. I thought I was gonna die and never see that in my lifetime, right? Um, so what's gonna happen with that? I don't know, really, but I do think that for the first time, we're interested on continuation, I mean, we were never proud of anything before, and now we want certain things to continue. That's really strange. So how do we do that? That's the question. And now we go into like political practices and how do people make sure that that happens? We're really good at complaining. We're really good at making big manifestos. We're really good at like Facebook campaigns, like nobody beats us with that. But what, are we gonna go and meet with the enemy? Are they the enemy? Is, it a, is that a good way of understanding politics in general? You know, maybe we should not think about it that way. You know, how, how well are we trained to sustain a meeting and keep an agenda and just, you know, comply and send the letter with a little stamp that if you didn't send it, just did not happen. You know, it's, it's a whole sort of, um, let's say, political culture as opposed to cultural policy. And this is the interesting part. We don't need cultural policies anymore right now. We need a political culture that allows us to sustain a number of things. The question right now, it's up for debate. Will we be able to do it? I, I can list a number of obstacles for that happening. But I think what's really interesting is that the approval rate that this mayor had, which was crazy, was like 70%, even without doing anything, has dropped at least 20%. And the first item in the list of why this happened is cultural policy. That's very bizarre for Lima, I think. I don't know what my fellow Peruvian friends think about that, but that's, that's new. So uh, I think that one of the things is that I don't want to paint it as a, as, a, as a situation that you have all these movements that are just succeeding because success is also a very, it's a very weird thing. It's a moving target. And you have to be really careful because if you start evaluating success in terms of did the law come through? Come on, like, that's, uh, you know, are, are we really just, oh, how are we going to measure that? And when we measure it, why are we going to measure it? For the benefit of whom? You know, and I think we need to get, uh, 
I, I was talking to somebody, it's like the word sophistication comes to mind. Like we need to be more sophisticated about this. We need to be more detailed. We need to be more precise with the words. We need to be, it's a moment of just demanding a lot more from us than just simply saying, I don't agree. I think this is bad, right? But you know, the, the other thing that I wanted to bring, the, the reason why I brought the, the example of the net neutrality is because how many, how many people here had heard about the net neutrality battle? Hands up. R hands up, really. Okay, just a couple of you. This is one of the most important civil rights battles of our generation, and only a few of us very enlightened people had heard about it, right? Mm -hmm. And what's fascinating is that what brought up, actually, Obama and to make the statement and say, no, this is a, we're gonna treat as a utility, it's a, you know, and you guys are not gonna privatize it, was just a couple of people sending emails, talking to their congressman, an incredible Facebook and social media campaign. In other words, we, we tend to, th to think that it takes a huge political culture to do effects and changes, when sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes all it does is a small number of people que son bien, 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 you know, hold on so, hold on, you know, que juegan mucho, can, can, can do marvelous things, right? And that's an example of a social movement that was brought up by a couple of people that were very connected. So at the, at the level of culture, the parallel with this cultural equity group, um, what my observation, and I'll leave it here, is that um, there seemed to be kind of fear, you know, because um, I, I was in a lot of the meetings, pe fear that people faced about um, demanding a transformation of New York City's cultural policy and say it's racist, you've got to change it, it's not fair. Because there's a lot of interest that don't want to change it, that they don't want to change that there's 33 cultural institute, institutions that are guaranteed by the government from the charter of 1817 or 1700, I don't know what else, that they have their, their utilities, their buildings, the Metropolitan Museum is one, the American Museum, some of the biggest one, right? Some of them, so we cherish those institutions. Tourists love them. There's a lot of interest. So there's a lot of people who are kind of tiptoeing around the fact that we want more money as opposed to we need to change the racist cultural policy funding structure. That means that all the money goes to the same institutions as opposed to the rest of us. You know what I'm saying? So I think that there's something to be said about when we do politics and activism is to ensure that we don't edit ourselves and we, and we dare to be as brave in the kinds of um, things we demand and, and imagine, as opposed to, well, the structure is like this, we can possibly change that, it's too powerful, just give us a little money. Because just giving us a little money is never gonna change the incredible inequity of, upon which the funding structure is based, right? So anyways. It, I just wanted to say two, two things. I think uh, you also need to call things for what they are. Like you just say racist cultural policies, you need to say it. You need to say, these are racist cultural policies. You need, somebody said colonialism recently. There's a whole work on coloniality, right? Peruvians have written a lot about coloniality and how that creates a matrix of power that racializes work, right? And so that needs to be called upon, you need to say it. Because if not, we talk in the language of effectiveness. Did we really, did we make a good cultural policy or a bad one? Were we effective or not effective? Did we show good indicators or not? We benchmark ourselves as opposed to just question what are the structural undercurrents that are determining this whole thing? And it's not a small, it's, it's not a minor detail. It's, it's, I think it's very foundational, right? Uh, I would also like to ask a question for the panelists. Um, and it's related to what you were talking about of how can we continue the things that were happening, let's say from one government to the other and how can we make sure that things are just not erased from the bottom. Um, and I was thinking of two things. One is institu institutionality. Um, that word was also mentioned um, around along the day. Um, how can we make, is it a matter that we need to institutionalize culture? We need to strength the institutions that we have? Or how, how can we make them more powerful in the sense that things cannot be just um, erased from, from bottom. And another thing that I was thinking, and also you mentioned uh, this comparison between North and South, uh, is the role of the government and advocacy. So if we put all, as this English saying, if we put all our eggs in a basket, then what happens to that basket if it falls down? No. So are we only putting our eggs into the government basket? Or you are talking about advocacy and you're talking about how can civil society mobilize to advocate for, for having continuity, but what are the things that 
and I know because they are they are happening, they're happening everywhere, there are a lot of organizations doing that. But what is the role of the civil society not only for advocating but for making those things happen? And yeah, that's a long question and for for all of you. <laughs> I agree. It's, it's, it's okay. <coughs> um, I agree with Pilar and the role of the social agent is is um, very important. And but in Latin American countries, the government has a lot of uh, uh, not not just power but um, positive uh, image uh, in the um, in, in, in the <coughs> role of uh, managed culture so I think the uh, communitarian projects uh, are the, the very important to um, develop new um, new subject to to content in the political um, arena. I think that we, what the point I want to make is that it's not either or, right? We, I think we have tended to be in a space where we have naturalized that the market and foundations and entrepreneurship and the great uh, agents will strive. And it's because they're wonderful and then that's it. And what I want to say is that's not the case, that we need to hold our governments accountable because we have let them off the hook, right? And, and that's really, I want to return to a moment where we can imagine that the government is responsible because culture is, is a human right. So like education is, like you, know, you want to push it, housing. So it's a way of reimagining um, so that culture is not seen as this kind of like, um, you know, beautiful thing that after everything is done that we could then fund. No, that you, that you insert it into every conversation and into every, so that means that, you know, we as scholars and thinkers, and what I love about these kinds of uh, meetings is that you guys, you know, you're the new generations, right? You're gonna be our administrators and you're gonna be leading foundations and or whatever it is you're doing, you're going to be in positions of power where if you're sitting with a kind of neoliberal, you know, pundit, right? Somebody que se come, que se, que se, that, 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 that drank the Kool-Aid of the free market, you know, when you're confronted with one of those types that you remember this conversation and you say, hell no. Because you know, uh, the free market is based, you know, is, is based on inequities and it's not fair. And you know, and 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 and, and did you defend? Did you defend um, the, the role of you know government and 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 and, and as um, w without shame? Because sometimes people, oh, that's just the past. Just you know, that's just you know, they either look at you as either you're socialist from the 1960s or they think you're like you know like totally deluded as opposed to no, the corporation, you know, the government is giving right now huge tax breaks. You know, in Puerto Rico, if you're a millionaire, you can actually go to Puerto Rico and not pay taxes right now. I mean, that's bananas. Um, I, I was, I, I agree with, uh, I also agree with the idea of like, I think imagination again is a huge thing. I think imagination is really, the idea of like what is really possible so Arjuna Padurai talks about probability versus possibility, right? And the word of probability is the world of the markets and quantification and everything that measures stuff up and tells you that's just not likely, I'm sorry, right? And then the world of possibility is the one you create yourself, the one you sort of prove by a feat of strength or a Herculean you know, move that things can happen. You can get people together to talk about cultural policy. You can do all sorts of stuff that people are doing. But the thing is that I think government needs to be re-understood. Governance in general actually has been quite co-opted by neoliberalism speak, right? It's like, it's, it's a very complicated thing. But I'm just gonna tell you uh, an anecdote that I always tell, which is uh, the people in Medellin working with the cultural plan in Medellin. We had a conference in the Encuentro one time and the secretary of Medellin came to talk to us about the plan and we, we worship this plan. We think the plan is wonderful. Everybody wants to do the plan because they have a plan and it's, it's really well done. It's been validated by all these people that are, so she sits next to us and we say, okay, we live in Peru where plans are just simply words on a piece of paper, right? Nobody follows through. How do you do that? How do you make plans work? You know, and he's like, well, you know, it's a plan. And he's like, yeah, that's fine, but we don't follow plans. But you know, uh, it's, it's, you know it's, it's something that we agreed to do. And it's like, yeah, but see, you're saying these things and it, they don't make any sense. And then she said, oh, okay, I think you're thinking about a plan like a list of goals that you need to achieve. And a plan is not a list of goals. A plan is a pact between people who are in power at one point in time and people who are not, 
and how, you know, con conceiving of this is something that will change constantly. But it is a pact that you work through deep political work, a lot of commitment, a lot of allegiances, a lot of pictures being taken, hands shaken, people disagreeing, and then getting to the point in which you said, we agree that we're going to move together in this horizon. You know, we're going we're gonna to move forward with this together with our differences, but having agreed on these points. That's what a plan is. It's a pact. If you don't have a pact, you don't have a policy. What we have right now is a lot of written stuff, but no pact. And to do a pact, you need to conceive about things interculturally. You need to think that the person who's there is important for you to move forward. Policy in Latin America is made without looking at the other person. You just move. You just go. You don't need to look at them. You don't need, it's not in the Constitution. It's not in my Reglamento de Operación y Funciones. I don't need to take, you know, I just go. So it, it's, a, it's a way of like reimagining the political bond that we have as people. That's the demos in democracy, the people together, right? So it's like the we the people thing, but, you know, don't let it be hijacked kind of thing. Well, this is really interesting. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. It's very short. Um, <laughs> um, thanks. It's a 20 second comment. Uh, please remember that besides social media, there are many well established citizens organizations here in New York City that do, surprise, letter writing campaigns. Uh, uh, because one letter is worth a hundred people who don't write a letter. So please include older persons of these organizations who do that. Don't exclude us. I'm 67 years old. I write letters, okay, and I do social media. But please include us. Don't exclude us. Nothing about us without us. Thank you. Do we have time for another question? Yes? Okay. Yes. I'm sorry, the microphone, please. Okay. Thanks so much uh, for coming out and sharing these ideas. Um, I'm really glad that I came. Um, one thing I think that I value about a kind of contemporary culture that we're in politically um, is this willingness to interrogate and categorize systems of power. Um, and this comes from philosophy, what we know of Foucault, and movements that have been taking place over a long range of time. Um, and there are real problems, right? But we know that they, they kind of vary based on where we go. Um, I'm Nigerian, I hold two passports, but I'm also American. So I have a foot in two different places. Apparently, these are places that seem sort of on opposite sides of a power structure. But Nigeria is actually one of the wealthiest nations in the world. Um, I was having a conversation just in December with my older brother who lives there with his family, um, older half-brother, and it was just a casual one. It's a very classist society, but since everyone is more or less the same race, there isn't so much a discussion of the racialized nature of injustice, as everyone here has touched upon, but it's more like class. And one thing that he said was that, um, what incentive is there for me to go out and protest for people who, um, you know, probably in some way they're contributing to their own oppression? And that made me think, entering another context, that there is a fundam there's something fundamentally human about, not human, it's, it's, um, it's a vice, but about this thing about tending to exclude and how it shifts and how our identities shift based on where we are. And I wanted to talk about um, just the kinds of mistakes that we can make when we begin to totalize our identities as whites in certain contexts, as blacks, or Asians, or whatever. And I think what we're missing here is like talking about how dynamic we are, but it's not, it's, it's not seen as, I guess, a point of discussion these days, because racism is a very real thing. Um, but it's not the way it is like probably in Latin America Absolutely. as it is here. 
I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm very happy you brought the issue of class because I think yeah. at the heart of your question is the issue of class and hierarchies that, that really impregnate this whole the debate. Um, particularly when you're talking about, you know, like when I talk about black and Latino groups engaging in the cultural equity group, right? There's, I'm not ever saying that there's a homogeneous, right? Because within the Latino groups, there's a lot of debate about the ongoing mainstreaming and elitization of Latino culture that is very much part of the international affairs that Bruna was talking about, that want to Latin Americanize, right? And so that El Museo del Barrio has been at the battle of that confrontation, right? Um, and that's why I highlight this concept of barrio creatives, because to me, it's bar barrio uh, cultural creatives in, in the book, in cultural works, because it's a way of anchoring community and anchoring the grassroots groups that are not recognized, right? We're talking about artists who are community-based. It's, it's, there's a spatial component to their work, right? And there's also an element of mobility that also, when we talk about class dimensions of, 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 of culture, there's this notion of you know, culture as, it, as a disembodied from spaces so that it could be sanitized and cleaned up and commodified and circulated. So um, there's a lot there, but, the, uh, but, but you're very much right that when we're talking about cultural equity, um, absolutely the dimension of Eurocentrism is, is at the heart of the matter, but is very inflected by class. And, um, and it, we cannot disentangle it. Uh, but the most uh, um, alternative and daring component um, claim you could make right now is one where you are, where your definition of culture is very, is very much rooted with the grassroots and with people that are rooted in the community. And that's a working class, working people, not officiated, institutionalized spaces. And that means, you know, many institutions, many funders don't recognize that, right? They don't recognize those artists. They don't recognize those institutions. So you're not, you don't have a, you don't have a developer. You don't have somebody with a degree in art history. You don't have a former curator. Um, you know, there's a lot of elitism, right? When we think about art, that you know exactly what you're talking about with the Vigeros, right? Um, if you want to address that point more, but the issue of class, absolutely, uh, we should never, never lose lose sight of it. Yes, I, I, I agree with this uh, distinction and in, in my examples I, I try to, to um, be clear about the, um, how these people um, understand culture and how they can act uh, but they, they, are, they have no visibility in this society so uh, the the concept of culture is not a property of uh, the state or the institution. Every everybody has culture, so we we just uh, recognize some kind of uh, cultural practices and not others. So the 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 idea is. Um, mm, we, we have to be more um, sensible to uh, share um, our knowledge with the knowledge of other people. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for our three panelists. Uh, I need to wrap it up. Uh, we have a coffee break. We are being a bit delayed in our schedule, but please um, take a We'll take a break of 10 minutes and we're coming back. We have coffee, cookies, yeah, and coffee. <laughs> Thanks so much, uh, Mauricio, Adlene, and Professor Montaldo. <laughs>